Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? All right. Good evening, everyone. And good evening to our Zoom participants as well. We'll be seeing their faces on the screen after the PowerPoint um, presentation. I'll remind our Zoom um, members to put yourselves on mute and we will hear your questions later on. All right, so please have a seat. I hope you're all wearing name tags. My name is Julie Ogawa. I am the board representative for adult education here at Shir Hadash. And I wanna welcome you to this very special event. I'm very excited to hear um, what our speaker has to say. And I will read a little bit about his background. And you'll probably learn a lot more about him as the night goes on. So this is Dr. Mark. We're back in the old days. That's in the old days when you had the mimeograph and then on the left side, you had all the names. On the right side, you had the attributes. And then with your number two pencil, you had to draw a line across the sheet, you know, to connect them. Um, then the hardest part of the test, fill in the blank. Um, Mongoloid have blank lips. And then you have to, like, know um, what that was. So Jews and whiteness uh, are subject for today. Um, it's great to be here at Shir Hadash. We've spent the whole afternoon together, so thank you for all the work you have um, put into uh, to creating this experience. Um, if you're in my undergraduate class, I like to have um, an historical question uh, and my thesis statement uh, at the beginning of each one. Uh, if people are taking notes. Like this would be the note-taking part. And uh, the question we have for tonight, and you gave me four hours to talk, right? Is that it? Um, <laughs> Are white presenting Jews white? And uh, what are its implications? That's, that's what we're going to cover. And the thesis uh, arguing is that Jews, more than any other American ethno-religious group, maintain an ambivalent, if ever-changing, relationship to whiteness. Over time, place, and person, its very definition proves contested. Ultimately, Jewish whiteness exposes the dynamics of privilege uh, and the powerful, sometimes destructive ways it plays out in American Jewish life. Uh, so I've already had um, an opportunity to talk to a few of you, and I know I have a, a very literate um, uh, and highly educated and engaged audience. Um, so if this is rep if I'm repeating, please bear in mind so that everybody can sort of catch up. Um, this is a rhetorical question. When you get those affirmative action forms and you have to check off your racial group, um, this is like the moment for white Jews at least because um, they don't have Jewish on there. Uh, they have a line that says other. And <coughs> oftentimes I check other and write in Jewish. So um, that would be sort of the moment at which I think today's talk would resonate you know, with more people. So today we're gonna to define whiteness. I'm gonna give you a historical overview of Jews and whiteness and then look at its implications. And then we're gonna have question and answers afterwards and have an opportunity uh, to talk about this. So uh, I'm an historian, but I'm a, a frustrated sociologist. So we'll start with sociology. You know, I get to spend a few minutes in sociology. Whiteness is not just biological. And this gets a little tricky, which is to say, of course, one's race is defined by the color of one's skin. And certainly in the United States, the way the racial hierarchies work, uh, people of color are on a lower racial uh, status or caste um, than those who present as white. And race is also defined sociologically, which means one's relationship to power. As one's power increases, one is considered to be more white. For Jews, white presenting Jews, under the Nazis, we were not considered white. We were considered subhuman, genetically, scientifically, and that led to genocide. So um, as a Jewish studies professor, uh, I think that this is actually like the group to study, to understand that racial definition and composition um, is what's called socially constructed. It actually can change. What, what, whether or not you are white 
is not just about uh, the, the color of your skin. So here's the best way to do it. Let's imagine your great, great, great grandparents, however many it takes to get 16 ancestors up there. Um, let's imagine that 15 of them came from Italy and the 16th came from Ireland. What are you? You're Italian. Probably you're, you have an Italian name. You probably have Italian ethnicity. You're probably Roman Catholic. You know, you food, food and culture and the rest of it is Italian. Let's take somebody else with 15 Italians, but in the 16th slot, let's put an African. What are they? They're black. Because in the United States, we have what's called the one drop rule. One drop of African blood makes you black. Yeah. Yeah. So 15 sixteenths Italian does not necessarily make you Italian based upon uh, the way uh, history has worked. And um, are we recording this tonight? Okay, that's fine. I have tenure. I'm going to continue speaking. Um, here's a word that tends to be a little triggering. The word is quotas. So here's how quotas worked. In the 1920s, we had anti-Semitic quotas, the most infamous at Harvard University, where they only admitted a certain fixed number of Jews. Um, and then after that, forget it. You know, even in the 1950s, um, we had quotas. Uh, there's a whole lot of Jewish pharmacists who were trained in the 1950s because they're anti-Semitic quotas against getting them into medical school. So they had to end up going to pharmacy school. So in the 1960s, when Lyndon Baines Johnson and the Great Society um, decided to um, bring back quotas, almost every national Jewish organization flipped out um, and was opposed to quotas because quotas were anti-Semitic and quotas are against liberalism and they had all the reasons against quotas. Except, this is where the tenure comes in. In the 1920s, quotas were created to preserve power in the white elite. If you were white in the 1920s, you liked quotas because it kept people of color out. In the 1920s, white Jews were people of color. We're not considered white, and we suffered anti-Semitism due to those quotas. What LBJ did in the 1960s is he flipped it. The first idea was everybody have some racial justice sense and be inclusive. That didn't work. Then they had affirmative action, which is trying to take some extra efforts to bring marginalized communities and communities of color into power. That worked sometimes, sometimes it didn't. And then it got to the point where there were um, moments where it, the famous one was um, Boston's fire department would only hire like white Irish guys to be firemen. And then the courts came in and said, you got to diversify. And they're like, we're not going to do it. So then the court said, you got a quota. Now you have to, like 10% or whatever the quota was going to be in order to, in, in order to racially integrate. So in the 1960s, the way it worked was um, if you were a marginalized person, you were benefiting because you were moving into power. And if you were white, you weren't. You were upset because you're on the outside. So if you're a self-interested white Protestant in the 1920s, you loved quotas but you hated them in the 60s. Let's say you're black in the 20s, you hated quotas in the 20s, but you loved them in the 60s. Jews are the only group that hated them both times. How is it possible that that is possible? Because between the 20s and the 60s, Jews became white. Jews were considered marginalized and faced discrimination from the 1920s quotas. But by the time the 60s quotas came, when a minority group is going to come into power, um, Jews were already powerful. So um, that is sort of my best illustration of what's called the social construction of race and the way in which um, the way someone is presenting is not necessarily whether or not um, they're white. So this is Professor Eric Goldstein, and I want to give him credit. He's at Emory University, uh, and he wrote this book. This is the standard book on today's subject. And if you are interested in learning more, I highly recommend that you read The Price of Whiteness, Jews, Race, and American Identity. 
Um, there's another, there's basically two really good books here. The second one is by um, a now retired UCLA professor um, of anthropology, Karen Brodkin. And I love the title of her book, How Jews Became White Folks and what that says about race in America. Um, if you have to pick, now here will be, even it's being recorded, it'll be my scholarly interpretation. Brodkin's book is easier to read. And uh, Goldstein's book is his uh, dissertation from the University of Michigan. So the, the more serious scholarly book is, is Eric Goldstein's and the one that I give to my students because it's just easier. She tells a lot of, Brodkin tells a lot of stories about growing up, you know, and what it was like for her. So it's, it's a little bit more of a personal read. Um, or you could um, read them both. That would be great. So here's my thesis. Jews moved back and forth across the racial divide. And now I'm, I'm speaking only of white presenting Jews, not Jews of color, for whom this conversation is actually going to go in different dimensions, and we can get into that during the Q&A if you want. Um, white Jews moved back and forth across the racial divide. Sometimes it was a good thing. Sometimes it wasn't. But I would argue that it's a really nice way to frame American Jewish history. And we're going to start in the Gilded Age. So I got like a Gilded Age thing. Gilded Age is 1877, the end of Reconstruction, uh, to basically 1901. Two or three things happened in 1901. But so the late 19th century, um, that's called the Gilded Age. And uh, in the Gilded Age, Jews were not considered white. Normally, it's not a good thing not to be considered white in America, because we have a system called white supremacy, which gives you a whole lot of benefits if you end up being considered white. In the Gilded Age, they weren't. But it turns out, Eric Goldstein found, it was a really good thing not to be white in the Gilded Age, because um, the word on Jews was, here was the science, they called it scientific, it's eugenics, it's pseudoscientific. So I like to say pseudoscientific because they thought they were telling the truth, but we know now they weren't. Jews, they thought, were genetically predisposed to study. What's, what's wrong with being a people genetically predisposed to, to loving, loving books? Um, Jews were genetically predisposed to work hard. Um, so that's good. Um, Jews are part of what later be known, became known as Judeo-Christian character. So the idea that Judaism was the forebear to Christianity linked Jews to Christians in ways um, that uh, non-Christian or non-Jewish, you know, non-Abrahamic faiths did. Um, I'll just say Jews were predisposed, genetically predisposed to be really good husbands, you know, like they're not going to, you know, the line was they don't beat their wives, but my wife and I are very involved with Shalom Bayat and they do. So I want to make sure that we we deal with domestic violence in our community as well. Um, and Jews are temperate. Jews don't drink um, so much. So, you know, like, well, I know, I know whiskey and brandy and stuff is big now on Chavez. But um, so in this case, Jews were not marginalized, even though they were not considered white. We all feel good? I just want to give you a moment of feeling good because now it's going to get bad. The progressive era, 1901 to after the Great War, after World War I, about 1919. This is Walter Littman's famous script and mastery, published it in 1914, 21 years old, one of the greatest books ever written in the 20th century. I tell my students, if you're not yet 21, that's how long you have to write a book like Drift and Mastery. Um, in the progressive era, Jews are still not considered white in this country, but now it becomes a really bad thing. Eugenics was a pseudoscientific idea that if you study people's genetics, then we can have scientists improve the lives of everybody because if you can fiddle with genes, then you can apply science for the good of society. Um, it was a nice idea. It quickly became racist because when they started lining up sort of who's genetically smart and who's dumb, it was on racial lines. It became sexist. It became anti-Semitic. And Jews now, as a Semitic stock, became known as inferior. Inferior. Jews were inferior. Jews were not white. And it was a bad thing and genetically predisposed to, um, to bad things. So this is William Ripley's um, book, um, The Races of Europe. William Ripley, believe it or not, 
Uh, that's my Ripley's Believe It or Not joke. My students don't get it. Because Ripley's Believe It or Not and Fisherman's Wharf closed years ago, so they don't even know about Ripley's. There's no relationship between this book and the Ripley's Believe It or Not, but still. Um, this book was uh, published in 1899, so this is the turn of the 20th century when things are getting really bad, and Ripley was a respected anthropologist. I want you to know that these ideas are not like the radical fringe, which is getting mainstreamed. This is the mainstream, and um, according to um, according to, to to Ripley, white people from Europe were actually divided into three different sub-racial groups. Um, and here they are. And I put them up just because they use a lot of vowels to make it sound more scientific too. So the first group um, are the Teutonics. The Teutonics are um, from Northern Europe, Britain, not Ireland. Ireland gets, gets taken out. Um, and Germany and France and Scandinavia. These are the smartest people these are the most successful people, and these are the most democracy-loving people. And uh, you definitely want to be Teutonic. And the reason they're all these things is because their genetics predispose them to being all these good things. So there is, in their mind, a scientific basis to being superior, and it's rooted in whiteness, and it's rooted now in, a, in, in like, you don't want to just be European and white. You want to be Teutonic. Because Alpines, Switzerland, Austria, not so much. A Swiss person is smart, but they cannot be as smart as a Teutonic, as hard as they may try. It's just not in the science. And they could be successful and democracy loving. And the only thing we can say about the Alpines is thank goodness they're not Mediterranean. And the Semitic stock also goes in with the Mediterraneans, the Italians, and the Greeks. And for us, the Eastern European Jews are the least intelligent and are the ones who, regardless of hard work, will never have the capability of being as good as the Teutonics or even the Alpines. By the way, the Italians invented the Renaissance and had da Vinci and Michelangelo. So the critics went to these folks and said, how do you explain art and Italy? And as being the good scientists as they are, they said, oh, that's an excellent question. So we're gonna change our thesis. The thesis is now gonna be, the Italians are idiots except for art. We don't know why something in their gene pool makes art work when the rest doesn't. We'll work on it, you know, as good scientists. So, um, all right. I went into history to avoid math, but we're gonna do a little bit of math. If a Teutonic, partners up with the Mediterranean or Semitic and has a child, what racial classification is the child? I don't know. I, I would say Alpine because it's in the middle, <laughs> right? You get one from the top, one from the bottom. The kid's going to be 50-50, right? The kid's going to be in the middle. Let's have that kid grow up and, um, and partner up with the Teutonic. We only want the best genetic stock. They have a kid. That kid grows up Teutonic. Let's just keep the generations going Teutonic every time. How many generations will it take to restore that child to pure 100% Teutonic stock? It's an XY axis question for those of you who are in mathematics. Uh, two, so, so the first generation, the first kid would be 50%. Um, the next one would be 25. The next one would be 12 and a half, six, infinite. You actually, you never, you never get there. You will never return to 100%. A single drop of inferior racial blood is going to condemn every subsequent generation to being genetically inferior, to being racially inferior. This is the threat of eugenics. This is the scientific anti-Semitism that comes in. Um, and even though I might get to it in a moment, I want to say it now. I was in Warsaw last week for the uh, 80th commemoration of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. And if you believe, like, so in early anti-Semitism, the uh, upset was that the Jews rejected Jesus as the Messiah. And the remedy was convert to Christianity. Now, that's not good for the Jews, but that's how you remedy somebody who's upset that you don't think Jesus is the Messiah. You, you believe that Jesus is the Messiah. 
what's the remedy for what I just described? That an inferior genetic stock is going to marry somebody who is an Aryan or someone at the top. They're going to ruin every ancestor that follows, every descendant that follows. So the first thing is sterilize them, which is what the Nazis did in the early 1930s, and then genocide. Genocide is the logical consequence of this kind of application of pseudoscientific principles to um, racial definition. Madison Grant, 1916. I love a book title that gives its thesis, The Passing of the Great Race. And the great race is the white, the white race. And this is white supremacy once again. Um, Madison Grant said that intermarriage between immigrants from Eastern Europe and Southern Europe, this is 1880 to 1920, this is where 2 million Eastern European Jews came, probably a lot of people here have ancestors who are part of that immigration. He said in this book, unless the country excluded all inferior racial and ethnic groups, the superior Nordic strain, which he called the source of rulers, organizers, and aristocrats, would be swamped by what he called the weak, the broken, and the mentally crippled. It gets worse. The KKK reemerges in the 1920s, rooted in this eugenics, racism, and anti-Semitism. The motto of the KKK of the 1920s was 100% Americanism. That, the KKK of, of Reconstruction, that, that, that was not their motto. It's really important to recognize what 100% Americanism means. 100% is a scientific thing, 100%. If there's an intermarriage with an inferior racial stock, you're not going to have a 100% American. You're going to have a 50% American. So they were about white supremacy and creating their version of white, white America and white Jews were not white and white Catholics were not white, by the way, with the KKK. Catholics also suffered from that. All right, quiz. Most popular state for the KKK of the 1920s. Yeah. How do you know that? Right there, Indiana. Okay. Uh, so I'll go back here for the people on Zoom. Uh, Joy just read read my notes ahead of me. Um, she happens to be from Indiana. All right. So the 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 correct incorrect answer is Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana. That's what you would think. It turns out to be Indiana. Number number two state uh, KKK influence in the 1920s. Yeah. Oh God. Yes, Colorado. Well done. I just want you to know that uh, we're all very impressed, Joy. Um, but being impressed with you is not enough. Um, you, 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 in fact, deserve a prize. And the good news is um, I brought prizes. So um, one moment for those of you on Zoom. I will explain this in a moment. But I'm now going to give a prize to Joy. Okay. And uh, I've hidden the prizes over here so you couldn't see them. Because I, I, I didn't want to, like, these are, these are not just pencils. <laughs> These are genuine Jewish studies themes. <laughs> uh, Like the pencils too. Yes, in Colorado elected a governor who was a member of the KKK. Um, so what we see here in the 1920s is that institutional racism and anti-Semitism was a Midwestern phenomenon. Uh, and it was really about sort of the, the, the farming agricultural Midwest, um, even more than the Deep South. Uh, and uh, and, to, and to have you know white Jews now not being white and being seen as um, as, as a group that will undermine the prized genetic stock of America. Um, Skull's experiments, um, they called it cranial capacity. All right, that's a fancy way to say, how big is your brain? And uh, here was the theory, the bigger um, your brain, the smarter you were. 
So <clears throat> the larger cranial capacity will tell us who the smarter. So they got four skulls, a white man, a white woman, a black man, and a black woman. Uh, they chopped off the top of the skulls. They filled it with marbles. No, marbles don't sound scientific. They filled it with beads. And, um, and then they counted the beads. And uh, you'd never guess who won. Uh, the fact that they the fact that they self-selected the skulls and then threw a few extra beads in where they needed to, it turns out white men are the genetically most intelligent, followed by a white woman, followed by black men, followed by black women. And when all this happened, I just was thinking about Miss Lyle, seventh grade, social studies class at Malaga Cove Intermediate School. I'm like, wow, I think there's even a parallel between the 1920s um, and the 1970s. So eugenics strengthens through the 1920s. Um, the depiction of Jews as non-white and as a threat. And here's the flip side. I'm gonna tell you right now what's going on in the US in the 1920s and 30s. And we know that in parallel, the rise of Nazism in Germany in, in the 20s and 30s also is gonna be a, a mirror. Um, and as you've read Isabella Wilkerson's book, Cast, you know that the Nazis actually got um, their ideas um, uh, to go against Jews on inferior racial grounds from Jim Crow and the treatment of blacks in the American South. So um, what do you do if you are one of these um, scientific racist, scientific anti-Semites, and you're worried that um, all these stupid immigrants are coming over from Eastern Europe and Southern Europe, as they did in the 1880s and 1890s up through. Um, so they decided that in 1917, the US Congress passed a literacy test. And uh, my first thought, and I learned this when I was at UCLA, um, that the literacy test is gonna be, you know, one of these English only things, because especially in Southern California with Spanish, you know, it's like a big political issue. And then my professor said, no, you got to take the literacy test in your native language. And I said, well, that's dumb. You know, like why, why if you're having a literacy test, I assume they want you to be an English speaker. Um, and this is where he first laughed at me a little and then it explained to me how awful this was. Um, if you are so dumb that you don't have the capability of being literate in your own native language, how on earth are you gonna be smart enough to learn English? or to be a good US citizen or not pollute future generations of Americans. So the literacy test was a racist and anti-Semitic pseudoscientific act of the US Congress in order to filter out genetic idiots and bring in the smart ones. Um, that meant the Jewish immigrants took the literacy test in Yiddish. And uh, guess what? Too many of them passed. <laughs> Too many of them, you know, were literate in Yiddish. Um, so by 1921, in a lame duck session of Congress, that's after the election in November, and by then it was March before they came in, um, they decided to uh, uh, to be more, more strict and more stringent on these new immigrants who they now were fearing more and more were ruining uh, the prized genetic stock of the country. So in 1921, um, they started a quota system. It's called a national origins quota system. That's the official word, which means they look at what nation you came from, and then they have a quota for how many people can come in every year. And to figure out the quota, uh, it was 1921, and um, the 1920 census wasn't yet done. So they went to the 1910 census because that was done. And they said, okay, 3% of the 1910 census. So for every 100 Italians, in the 1910 census, three more get to come each year. And um, that was symbolically the end of like the Statue of Liberty idea of America, you know, send, send me your tempest, thought, you know, I'll forget it, right? Because now in 1921, the United States Congress is going to limit the number of white European immigrants. I wanna say Chinese Americans were excluded in 1882, Japanese Americans by the Gentlemen's Agreement in 1908, indigenous peoples and Africans and African Americans even before that. But there is a history of restricting immigration. But by 1921, even white Europeans who are not white enough are getting restricted. It was an emergency quota act because it was done at the last minute. Congress wanted some time to study. They took some time. They came back to it in 1924. And uh, in 1924, they decided 3% of the 
was too nice. And they dropped it to 2%. Um, fortunately, by 1924, the 1920 census was available. So they used the 1890 census. Wait a minute. He was speaking kind of fast. Did he just say that the 1920 census was done, but they went to the 1890 census? Yes, I did. Why do you go to the 1890 census? That was that? Yeah, fewer people, and you're being nice about it. Um, white people, yeah, or non white people, right? However, it is. If you want to do a racial snapshot of America in 1890, and a racial snapshot of America in 1924. That's basically the years that Eastern European Jews and Southern Europeans, Italians and such, immigrated. So this was pure scientific racism and scientific anti-Semitism by the United States Congress in order to ensure that the least number of Mediterranean Semitic stock immigrants can come to preserve the system of white supremacy in America. Um, and it gets worse. Because if you look at the actual quota slots, this is how it worked out. Great Britain and Northern Ireland got 65,721 slots each year. Italy got 5,802. Now, Italy had, I don't know, a gazillion immigrants coming over. And 5,800 a year doesn't even begin with family reunification. I mean, essentially, Italian immigration was ended. Um, 65,000 in Great Britain and Northern Ireland. I just imagine you're in London and you're enjoying your time in London. You're walking down the street and you're going, hmm, I think I want to move to New York City. And you walk into the US Embassy in London and they're going, yeah, we have 65,721 opportunities for people like you. So effectively, um, Anyone from the Teutonic nations had free and open immigration after 1924. And pretty much everybody from the lowest racial white status um, was denied. 85% of all the quota slots went to Northern Europe. There's the pause. And now, post-World War II America, or as Karen Brodkin argues, how Jews became white folks and what that says about race in America. Jews became white in the 1950s. And uh, if you look at the uh, quotas, the anti-Semitic barriers, all, all like no Jews and dogs allowed, like all, all of the stuff that was going around, um, through the 1950s, these were um, dropping precipitously. By 1960, we can still find anti-Semitism around, but sociologically, it's no longer having its impact or effect on Jews, which means that essentially by 1960 through the 1950s, Jews are getting into white suburbs. Those restrictive housing covenants that said no Jews or blacks allowed, um, now only say no blacks allowed. Now that's gonna create some complications because when Jews move into white suburbs, because now they're allowed, but blacks aren't allowed, um, that's gonna create a lot of um, intercommunal tensions. So vacation spots were now opening up to Jews, undergraduates and graduate education with the massive expansion of public universities uh, and uh, the GI Bill. The GI Bill, which gave to veterans after World War II, um, low interest education loans, low interest mortgage loans, low interest small business loans. Karen Brodkin calls the GI Bill the largest affirmative action program in all of US history, except this affirmative action program was only for white people. And in this case, now Jews were considered white people and were able to economically and socially um, elevate themselves in the 1950s and 60s um, as a consequence. So Jews achieved the American dream when they were um, welcomed into whiteness. They were able to integrate into the suburbs. Um, they were able to put their kids into public schools with Christian kids. Um, one of my favorite stories from my first book, which someone here actually was reading, so thank you. Um, 1951, in a white suburban school, the, 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 the chorus was doing Christmas carols. 
And the Anti-Defamation League found out they're doing Christmas carols in a public school. And they called the principal, said, separation of church and state. You got Jewish kids in your school. You can't do Christmas carols. And the parents of all the Jewish kids called the Anti-Defamation League and said, stop, stop. We worked so hard to get our kids into these schools and accepted the last thing we want is to have you do that. Let my kids sing a Christmas carol, um, which is also another, another idea. Um, complications of Jewish whiteness. Anti-Semitism was coming to an effective end. Um, racism was not. So what do you do if you're a white Jew living in the suburbs and um, you've you got a congregation um, or let's, let's make it more pointed. You've got um, a JCC. Are you going to admit blacks to a suburban JCC in the urban north? So the ADL actually um, surveyed them uh, in the early 1950s. They found out that half of the um, JCCs would not admit, only admitted Jews. Um, the number of black Jews in this population, I don't have data on what would happen if a black Jew walked in. That's an interesting question. Um, but for the half that would admit non-Jews, half of those were racially exclusive. Jews owned a lot of businesses, um, apartment buildings in urban America as part of you know, the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s. And when they moved to the white suburbs in the 50s, they keep the ownership um, of their businesses um, in urban America. So what black and brown communities are now seeing in the 1950s and 60s is it's their money going in to give a profit to the Jewish businesses, which are now getting sent out to the white suburbs to create the most ambitious synagogue construction decade, the 1950s, in all of American Jewish history. Um, and, and this is part of my other work on Jews and races around the civil rights movement, that this is in the 50s. This is the exact time of like Dr. King and everyone's getting along well, and this is really um, the undercurrent. So one moment where, okay, I don't know where I'm at on that. Um, Southern Jews, this was um, a particular challenge because what do you do if you're white and Jewish and Southern at the same time? And, um, for the most part, Southern Jews were quite ambivalent about the Northern Jews who came down in the civil rights movement. Uh, on the one hand, the lynching of Leo Frank was in 1913. It was in the lived memory of Southern Jews in the 1950s. There was anti-Semitism and they feared it and they weren't black. And in the South, the racial dichotomy was black and white. So for Jews, anthropologists called this word liminal because um, Jews are both white and not white at the same time. Um, they're white and enjoying the privilege, but they know white Christian South will never admit them. They're feeling persecution so they can go to the black community in solidarity, but the black community is like, you're white <laughs> and you'll never actually know what it's like to be me. Um, rabbi in um, Birmingham, Alabama. This is for you, Rabbi. My colleagues who have shouted the loudest, and this is about the civil rights movement, have not been willing to take Southern pulpits, period. And the main reason is economic. They like their $15,000 and $20,000 a year pulpits. That was back in the day. If you are truly sincere about your prophetic Judaism, then you would not hesitate to take a pulpit in Gadsden, Alabama for $9,000 a year. This is what a prophet does. But he has no right to tell someone else to commit economic suicide unless he's willing to do it himself. Rabbi Moses Landau, Cleveland, Mississippi, when they asked him if he'd get involved in the civil rights movement. Yeah, but it would have been limited to 24 hours. 24 hours later, I wouldn't be in the state anymore. The majority of the people of the city have been vehemently opposed to integration, including a great number of the Jewish community. The Jewish community could not exist, could not exist if they got involved in any way in the civil rights movement. So whiteness for Jews in the South will... Well, mute them, great. Whiteness for Jews in the South um, meant that they had to navigate, right? Their racial identity against, in this case, the civil rights movement. In the North, uh, and, and this is my most recent book, I talk about how when court ordered busing came into Northern suburban schools to integrate them, there was a huge rise in Jewish day schools, suburban Jewish day schools. Um, half the kids who went to the suburban day school were there because they wanted um, the least amount of Jewish 
to keep their kids out of public schools because they were getting integrated. And the other half were there because it was a Jewish school because they wanted Jewish. And then the parents would be on the board of directors and then they would um, fight with um, one another um, a whole lot. So um, let's look at the contemporary Jewish scene. Um, today, Jews enjoy a disproportionate amount of power and privilege. And this creates a moment now um, when communities of color and people of color are getting really frustrated with Jews. Um, There's one example, a, a JCRC called me um, and they needed me to give this talk to, to their lay leadership. And they said, it's like, they just got into this meeting with the Latinx community and uh, they walked in, the white Jews walked in as like, brothers and sisters, we're with you. And the Latinx people were like, the white people just showed up, you know? And, um, and when you have two fundamentally different understandings of your own racial status, it's hard to engage uh, in, in really good community um, relations. So um, I like to think that education is like a really good thing. And that if we have differences between people, if we just learn about one another, then everything will be wonderful. And all right, I'm spending my life like hoping that that's true. And one thing in the study of race is that as good as education may be, power is a whole lot better. Power is the ability to translate whatever you want into change or however you want it. And in a country that's governed by white supremacy, getting categorized as white is really helpful in terms of giving more power. Um, of course, it also brings up a whole lot of challenges about you know what do you do um, with that power. So uh, I want to bring you to a book in 1964 by Milton Gordon called Assimilation uh, in American Life. And uh, he was not talking about Jewish immigration. He was talking about um, European immigration. And in that case, it was white Europeans, even though we didn't say so in 1964. In this book, he said, there are seven steps to become, become American, seven levels of Americanization. And uh, go through each of the chapters and read it. So you... For Jews, sometimes you change your religious practice, right? If you were observed the Sabbath, maybe you don't observe the Sabbath. Uh, another thing is you change your name, right? That's another thing you do to become American. What's level seven? What's the last step to know that you have become American, according to Milton Gordon? Anyone have any ideas of like what the last, the last signpost as you're on your journey? What's that? Conversion? Or, oh, I like that, right? I don't like it, but I like the answer um, because if you are truly going to let go of your Jewishness, conversion is it. So oh, I have to change it to say, while remaining a Jew, as a Jew, what would it be, right? Because I think you're right. Conversion is ultimately in the modern period the the way that you, you what? Yes. Hold on. That's pencil with I'm going to be gendered about this. They may say they love you, but would they let you marry their daughter? Um, and when in America they let you marry their daughter, that's when Jews knew they made it. That's when, you know, white European Jews, they had achieved whiteness. Um, and that is, according to Gordon, the last step. So um, I'd like to say that in the Bay Area, we have very high rates of intermarriage, um, which is a sign of how great we are. And as I explained to my Jewish leaders when I give this talk, I said, if the goal of modern Jews is civil equality in a Christian dominated society, that's my definition for like the enlightenment, um, and the numbers, the last seventh trailing indicator that you are warmly accepted in the society is they let you marry their daughter, then more rates of intermarriage is a higher Jewish existence. And then I say, don't spend half your time screaming against intermarriage and the other half doing everything to try to increase the rate 
by trying to become a part of the larger culture. Um, so complicating, oh, that was one moment, okay. So um, complicating the narrative um, is Jews of color. And um, it, it's 12 to 15% we think of American Jews are Jews of color. This has to do with lots of things like um, who qualifies as a Jew of color. Um, and, and that's even challenging because there are people who qualify as Jews of color who do not identify themselves as a Jew of color. And everyone gets to essentially identify themselves as they wish. Um, that said, Black, Latinx, Asian, um, Sephardic, and Mizrahi, and indigenous. If you put all those categories together in the United States, we're looking at 12 to 15%. Um, and the question really now when we engage uh, Jews of color is where does whiteness relate to Jewishness? Another way to say it is where does one's Jewishness end and whiteness begin or vice versa? To what extent has Jewishness and whiteness been so smushed together that white Jews don't even know the difference, but when Jews of color present and then Jews of color present in predominantly white Jewish spaces, we learn very quickly that we have um, uh, issues that we need to reflect upon and we need to um, to resolve. So, um, all right, I'll tell a self-deprecating self-deprecating story. My most recent book is on Black Power Movement and the Jews, and uh, it was almost done. Um, I'd actually sent it in without an epilogue because it took me twenty years to write the book, and I wanted a break. So I sent it in and I happened to have lunch with my friend, Alana Kaufman. Do, do people know Alana Kaufman? She is the head of the Jews of, founder of the Jews of Color Initiative. Uh, she's a black Jewish woman. I had her read my book. And uh, what do you think? And she's like, uh, Mark, you wrote 200 pages on blacks and Jews and not a single page on a black Jew. How could you do that? Um, the good news is I had an answer because like anytime you get criticized for not writing the book somebody else wanted you to write, you know, you explain, this is a book I wrote. It's not the book, you know, that's a different book. And, um, and then she talked about what's called historical causation. What caused history to happen as it did? That's what every history book is. You, know, you have to say what caused it. And in my book, um, I said that, um, that, that politics in America influenced Jews. And I said that the 1960s influenced Jews. And I said that the Black Power Movement influenced Jews. That's what my book said, those three things. And then she looked at me and she said, how much did whiteness influence Jews? And she said, go back and reread each of your chapters. And if you're looking for causation, if you're looking to understand what mattered, investigate racial privilege. And I was like, damn, you're right. And I wasn't gonna rewrite the whole book. And I didn't think as a white man that I really could do as good of a job. But the good news is I hadn't written the epilogue and with Ilana's permission, I made our lunch the epilogue. So the epilogue of the book is really talking about Jews of color, black Jews in particular in, in regards to that book. And then the deeper question she brings up, because she's bringing up not only the fact that I had erased black Jews from history, which I did, um, but white Jews also need to look at the extent to which their whiteness is playing into their Jewish experience and not really aware to see it. And I think this is really where we're at right now in terms of being on the pulse. Um, this is David Beals, a National Jewish Book Award winning book from decades ago called Power and Powerlessness in Jewish History, because uh, boy, it's a whole lot better uh, to be powerful than powerless. And I'm telling you, this image, which I'm gonna to describe to you in a moment, is the most poignant illustration of it. This is Auschwitz, and flying over Auschwitz are three Israeli Air Force jets. And the fact that we're now finishing Omat's mood, Israel Independence Day right now, you know, even more so. So what happened was the Polish national government gave permission to the state of Israel to have Israel fly its, these are US made F-16s, to fly Israeli Air Force jets uh, to Poland and then over Poland. And these three flew in the missing man formation, um, yeah, okay, I don't, I don't have the video. Um, go, go on YouTube when you get home and just type in Israel Air Force over Auschwitz. It'll come up. <laughs> have tissues because it's, it's just extraordinary. The way they do the movie is it's in color as you see it. But the question is like, what would it have been like if there was an Israeli Air Force during the Shoah, during the Holocaust? They would have flown over Auschwitz and bombed the hell out of it to stop the death machine, which the Allies were not going to do. 
And what they did in the, when they made this movie is they switched between color and black and white. And whenever in black and white, they brought you back to World War II and they actually showed you like the, the, the bombing site and where it would have been like to drop it on Auschwitz. Um, I use this picture to relate to Jews and whiteness and race and that hierarchy. There is no group in the world that understands what it is not to be white more than the Jews because of Auschwitz. We suffered genocide in the lived memory of people today. At the ceremony we had in Warsaw last week, um, Marian Tursky spoke 93 years old, survived Auschwitz, survived two death marches, lived in Warsaw, became a journalist who wrote like against any oppression that you could see. Uh, we're not white if whiteness is relationship to power. And then you see those three jets. I know I'm being recorded, but I will tell you, latest estimates, State of Israel has 200 atom bombs developed in Demona, which is a nuclear facility in the, in the Negev desert. Um, what is the ultimate expression of powerfulness, the ultimate expression in this case of whiteness? Um, the ability to blow up planet Earth. The Jews have gone from genocide to the ability to blow up the planet in 60, 70 years is all that took. Um, and if you want to go 1945 to 1948, when Israel was created, even though they didn't have the atom bombing, three years. I argue so much of Jewish anxiety and ambivalence about racial definition and are white Jews white or not is the trauma now, you know, a social worker, the trauma of, of dealing with the impact of genocide um, regardless of the power. So this is Rabbi Irving Yitz Greenberg. Yeah, you know Yitz. Um, he, uh, he wrote an article called The Ethics of Jewish Power. For me, it's the most important essay ever written in Jewish studies, but I get to say that because like, I'm the professor and this is my academic field. And I wanted to read to you um, th three sentences from it. I'm going to read it first and then we're going to do a Rashi. We'll do an analysis of it and then I'll come back. Power corrupts but there is no other morally tolerable choice. The alternative is death. This is the lesson that the Jewish people learned in the Holocaust. Now I'll go back and explain. Orthodox rabbi, Rabbi Yitz Greenberg, power corrupts, ouch. You know, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely that line. He's talking, by the way, this article is about the state of Israel, and he wrote this in the 1980s, before the intifadas, before any of this now. He was so far ahead of his time in understanding that when Jewish people get power, and I'll say become white, we will be corrupted. Ouch. I, I would like us to have power and not be corrupted. I would like us to have power and do good things. Wouldn't it be nice if people could have power and not be corrupted? Um, so he opens, power corrupts, but there is no other morally tolerable choice. Rabbi, how could there be no other morally tolerable choice than to, have, than to be a corrupt power broker? I, I'm getting pretty sad and a little upset with Rabbi Greenberg. How is it that there's no other morally tolerable choice? The alternative is death. Well, ouch, right? have power and be corrupt or die. That's a hell of an option. This is the lesson that the Jewish people learned in the Holocaust. So much of his theology is post-Holocaust based. And when you've been through ultimate powerlessness, you need to get to powerfulness, you need to get to whiteness, even if you know that um, there is going to be corruption involved. So if the choice is whiteness or corruption, I don't know where we're going. With that, I leave it to all of you. <laughs> Thank you. I know that's a dramatic ending. That's not like you know. That's 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 a transition moment to to however you'd like to to move us from here. Okay. So for questions. <clears throat> Please form your question in the form of a question. Thank you.
Was Warren Hart, President Harding a cheerleader for quotas? A great question. I don't know specifically if he was. I have not studied him. Um, I'm going to assume he was only because of, you know, president in that era. I think everybody was, but I don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, yeah, I'll repeat the question. So on the seven steps of becoming American, where is renouncing your old country and embracing your new one? Um, I don't know because I don't remember from his seven or even if he had that in, in specific, but I would like to use that to riff on something else. Uh, Ukraine. Um, I am I am amazed that um, Jews who lived in, those of us who have ancestors who came out of Ukraine, and many of us did, it was not a happy place to be a Jew. It was a terribly anti-Semitic place, so bad that we ended up here in beautiful Los Gatos, California, as a consequence how awful Ukraine was. And then once the Russian invasion occurred, all these American Jews became huge Ukrainian nationalists. Um, now, they elected a Jewish president, so I think that's a huge deal. Um, but just as as one who is observing this, I, I'm just thinking um, they have now reinvented a Ukrainian national identity that they never had when they lived there and that they easily would have given up to become American because you want nothing to do with what that was. With that, that was. Yeah. Thank, thank you for letting us know the comment. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and right, and and so now, so oh yeah, so so it was not a question, but I'll I'll make it into a question, um, and and that is the story of of what it's like to grow up in L.A. as Mexican, and then to find that the, the parent of a Jewish woman that wants something to do with you because you're Mexican. And um, that's where I would argue that whiteness has intervened. Um, I would like to call that whiteness instead of Jewishness. I would, I would you know, I like to save Jewishness uh, from that. Um, I'm involved with the National Project now on, on Jews' whiteness and white supremacy. Um, and in our last, you know, Zoom meeting, I basically said, you know, whiteness um, can threaten the moral integrity of Judaism. Um, and and that's and, and that's that's the hard part. The worst part is not even knowing it's happening to see that. So thank you. Sorry, sorry you experienced that. Yeah. Mm Yeah, so 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 the, the comment was that in the Deep South, in this case, South Carolina, uh, there is a very long established Jewish presence, which was also a slave owning presence um, and was deeply, deeply ingrained in the white supremacist culture of, of the Deep South um, while folks were Jewish. Um, I, I do have a lecture, um, 350 years of uh, white Jewish racism, um, and it's the most challenging one that I give on the topic, uh, and it is the most requested by synagogues. So um, so. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. I was gonna say, um, th th this uh, first of all, appreciation to everyone right now because this is a tough topic and it's a lot of stuff coming at you. And I want to appreciate you know taking it in. And uh, as the rabbi says, it, it, it does more. Yes, please.
So the question is uh, on the southern border, and you asked me to speak as a sociologist, which I cannot because I'm an historian. Um, that's okay, but I appreciate the compliment. Um, and I, I don't really want to comment on the contemporary border because I, uh, it's it, it's not historical and it might be politically divisive. Um, so I'll be controversial in another way. I'll just look at your question from an historical perspective, um, which is that U.S. immigration policy has always been race-based. And it's always reflected a white supremacy uh, approach. Uh, and um, pick your time, pick your place, you know, uh, and, and the, 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 the consistent line um, is, is to see that. Um, in the Southwest and in Southern California, um, for lots of history, um, the US corporations were encouraging migrant farm workers to come north to work. Um, uh, Bracero program, it was called in the 1930s. Uh, and then when sort of the domestic political winds change, um, all of a sudden, you know, uh, well, actually, they still take, uh, they still take uh, um, migrant farm labor, they just don't recognize it and don't pay it well. And, and then the racism gets worse. So yeah, yeah. Okay, so the question is, if you take this thesis about whiteness, uh, corruption, power, and apply it to Israel, how does it look? Um, so I will say, uh, thank you. I'm not an Israel studies scholar. Um, Professor Ron Kaplan has a Goldman a chair in Israel studies, uh, bring him down. And now I'll give you my best from a US perspective. I have to say it's from a US perspective. Israelis can't figure this out for the life of them, Jewish Israelis. Uh, they, they come here. Um, and, and I'm mostly dealing with Jewish summer camps because I'm on the board of Camp Newman and we bring in Israelis and we're having more and more Jews of color and we're having um, moments of learning, you know, all the way around. Um, so if race is socially constructed, which means societies are going to decide who is what racial category and that's going to change over time and place. Everything I told you is rooted in the United States and in the U.S. history. According to our, the standard I gave you, the majority of Israeli Jews would be Jews of color. The majority, because they would be from North Africa, Mideast, Mizrahi, Sephardic uh, groups, right? Ethiopian as well. Yeah, Rabbi. So I have a question from Diane Fisher. Oh, hold on. Oh, I wasn't finished. Let me finish that. Oh, yeah, I'll finish that up, and then we'll go. Then we'll go to yours, Diane. So, um, so Jews of color in Israel don't ever see themselves as Jews of color. They, they're just the language isn't there, and and. And part of that is also the, the history of America and race and white supremacy and slavery, you know, and, and all of this uh, creates it. So when Israelis come over here and get, they get dropped into this, uh, you know, um, they don't know what to do. The flip side is the extent to which, and this is where um, a lot of the campus politics happens, there's a sense of solidarity between non-white people in every country of the world facing oppression from white people in every country of the world, as if that argument is consistent on racial lines. Um, and then the argument on Israel, that's the Israel-Palestine debate, um, is that um, each particular place around the world has its own history and its own context and its own understanding of race and racial composition. So it gets, it gets really um, uh, mangled really quickly. Um, so now we have, oh, we'll, we'll go here and then there. Yeah, yeah, Zoom, please. Diane Fisher is isn't the point of democracy effort to mitigate power, and that's, that is why democracy is the crisis in Oh, so I would like to collectively thank all of you for ask, asking questions that have nothing to do with what I specifically said and everything to do with the most volatile, bold, politicized, controversial topics to see. So my answer is yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, part, yeah, part, part of a democracy is a notion of a limited uh, government, and that's established by checks and balances. And we have a bicameral legislature, three, you know, three 
three seats of power, you know, and all of that. And what they're trying to do now in Israel is challenge um, the, the authority of the legislative branch over the judicial one, and that's seen as the threat. Please. So, so the question is, how many Jews were immigrating because, uh, from the pogroms in Poland and Russia and Eastern Europe? Between 1880 and 1921, 2 million Eastern European Jews immigrated. So my question for you is, at what year did your ancestors immigrate? Right. All right, so 1920 was open immigration. Uh, the, 1904, right. And all open uh, immigration closed in 1921. And then it closed more in 1924. And then the, 1921 and 24, it closed. And here's the implication. Hitler came to power in 33. So at the time that the Jewish refugees started to want to leave Germany in the mid-30s, and then certainly once the, the war begins with the invasion of Poland, there are highly restrictive quotas that can't come to the US. And FDR's State Department, which was anti-Semitic, um, was only filling 10% of the already small quota spots available for Jews. Um, he wrote that in a book called The Abandonment of the Jews, if you're interested in reading it. So, um, yeah. Now, what? Uh, yeah, now, the, 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 right, the quotas would not have been read for Jews because um, it would have been read for Poland or, or Russia, but it, the, the effect was against Jews. So, I, I don't know if you have so much time to hear me when I have but you, you, you brought uh, Rabbi Wimmer uh, at the end, uh, and you spoke about power and morality, and the need to have power and, and the moral challenge that power brings. You call it also the, the Kusari question, right? Uh, uh, Levy uh, asked the question, why do Jews have power? Why do Jews have power? I wonder if you have examples of idea what is that uh, use of power that can be for us. I would see some of those examples in Jewish life in the United States, or we are totally oblivious to the fact that we have power. Can Jews exercise power in a positive, non-corrupting way? Is that the question? Or, or examples? Both. Both. Examples? I mean, I have some examples okay. of, of good work. Yeah. This question is a violation of my historiographic perspective. Thank you. And now first I'll talk about historiography, then I'll answer your question. Historiography is um, how different generations of historians look at the same moment in history in a different way. And the basic premise is, whoever wrote about it 20 years ago is a stupid idiot, and you came along and you're gonna write the correct history and get it published, and you're getting it right, except 20 years later when the grad students read your book and call you an idiot, you have a little bit of humility. So um, the generation before me talked about how great the Jews were, how great the Jews were in social justice, um, Rabbi Heschel, Dr. King, um, God, thank God for the Jews, the Jews saved everything. And um, my generation was like, not so much. My generation is, well, all those things are actually true and they're in a larger context. So what you're asking me to do is go back to give the thesis of the earlier generation of historians that I've spent my career trying to undermine. So having, having established that, my definition of a hero, historical hero is someone who risks their own power and privilege for the benefit of another or we could say the benefit of the other, if we want to put it into racial terms. In one moment, I'll get you, I'll get you next. So um, the civil rights activists who went south, the Jewish ones, to register in Mississippi, they're heroes. They took the power and privilege that they had in allyship to um, help um, Black Southerners. That's the easy part to hear. The harder part to hear is while they were Jewish, they did not go down with Jewish organizations. 
They went with secular organizations. Schorner and Goodman, along with Cheney, a black man, were killed in Mississippi. The Jewish community went to sort of own Schorner and Goodman to talk about how typical they are as Jews because they did this. And one of their mom was like, don't, don't claim my child as a Jew. He did not go down as a Jew. He went down as a person. Now, maybe he got the Jewish with the mashed potatoes and he doesn't realize how Jewish he was. Um, but the, all right, I'll make it worse. If Judaism, if Judaism are, well, because I, I got tenure and I'm paid for this. Um, if Judaism's job is social justice, tikkun olam, then the Orthodox should have been most present in the civil rights struggle. Because for them, halacha, Jewish law, um, is most binding, if we, if we want to take that as, as the standard. Um, after that, it should be conservative movement Jews. There was only one prominent conservative movement Jew who was in civil rights, and that was Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. And he was all but excommunicated at his seminary, JTS, for doing what they did not think was a Jewish thing. The reform movement was had more than the other denominations. Um, but that said, secular Jews were more than reform. And um, there were socialist and communist Jews too. And they rejected Judaism and they were there in the highest numbers. There is an inverse relationship between level of religious observance and engagement in social justice activity. Um, yeah. What's that? Yeah, never mind. Okay, yes. There we go. There we go. All right. So, so sometimes, sometimes one can, uh, in, in weird ways, it gets leveraged uh, opposite. Uh, also, a question here. Yeah, thank you for that question. That goes to my first book, so I appreciate that. I, they never get questions on the first book. Um, and the question is, was FDR an anti-Semite? Um, if you don't want to read the book, go to a streaming service and find a, a movie called Deceit and Indifference, America and the Holocaust. It's from the PBS American Experience series. Deceit and Indifference, America and the Holocaust. It's his book in an hour. You can just watch it. Um, they conclude that the State Department was clearly anti-Semitic. Whether or not he was is a raging debate today. Um, and I got two colleagues and one's on each side of it. And because um, it's not my field, I wrote to each of them and they send me their op-eds the day they come out, you know, about, about uh, that. So, so here, here's what I wrote on FDR. Um, if you look at the New Deal, Part, a lot of New Deal programs are communist. A lot of them are socialist. A lot of them are capitalist. If you put them all together side by side, it makes no internal ideological sense to see all the different programs. And historians have been confused about who FDR is you know, on that. Um, the answer most of us have come up with is he's like a football quarterback. And uh, he's looking for a play that works and he'll try anything. And in the 1930s in the Great Depression, he did. And if a socialist kind of program works or a capitalist kind of program works, um, that would be great. So I think what happened with the Jews um, is that um, he's going to do whatever he needs to do in that moment to win World War II as he sees it. And if he has an anti-Semitic State Department and they say to him, we're not interested in the Jews or bombing Auschwitz, which are two things that they said, um, fine, right? Because he's... And the American Jews, by the way, supported FDR in this time period, because the best way to defeat Hitler is to support the allies, you support the, and you never want to go against the President of the United States in the middle of World War II, generally is, is um, and it turns out that when David Wyman's book came out in 1985, The Abandonment of the Jews, um, that generation of American Jews had no breath left because they idolized uh, FDR for all the good he did on the domestic side when it comes to Jews and couldn't believe that, that he was um, you know, causing such harm uh, internationally. Yeah, um, I went down to Miami, it's actually Boynton Beach, 
to teach uh, in one of the retirement communities. And I gave my FDR talk and it was over. And I had like an 85 year old guy come up to me afterwards. And he just started yelling at me because I said bad things about FDR. And by the time he finished yelling at me, I was concerned for his health. And I wanted to like have someone come over and help him sit down. And then I realized, do not speak to FDR's generation about FDR. It's just okay. We're going to go to something else. So um, I'll give you my, my FDR joke. Jonah, Gold, uh, Jonah Goldstein, Tammany Hall, New York judge said, any Yiddish speakers here? Okay, I'll speak freely. Said, um, American Jews, oh, so 1932, 90% of American Jews voted for FDR. No, sorry, that was 1936. 1932, 82% in 1932, 90% in 1936 of Jews voted for FDR. Pretty, pretty much every Jew voted for FDR. So much so that, that the judge said that um, Jews lived in three Velten. Uh, Velten is a world. Die Welt, this world. Jena Welt, the world to come. And Roosevelt. <laughs> I would like to thank you for laughing. I tell that joke to my undergraduates. They don't laugh. They stare at me. And then I said to them, that's a good joke. I said, tonight, that night, I was actually going give to give that talk. I'm going to give the joke. I said, they always laugh at the joke. And my students pleaded with me not to tell the joke because they did not want me to embarrass myself in public. So I would like to thank you all for laughing. And I know the joke still has currency. OK, uh, one and two. Yeah, we'll go for, for first, first year in front, and then we're going back, yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Wow, okay. So a South African example of somebody who uh, had what was then called colored and was given whiteness and error and then ultimately went back and removed the privilege. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Thank you. And between Israel and South Africa, there's lots of like transnational interesting comparisons. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, thank you. Yeah. So, yeah. So um, I love book titles that tell the thesis. As I told you before, one of my favorite book titles, I'm not going to recommend a book for you all, Deborah Dashmore, G.I. Jew. And it's the story of Jews in World War II. It's, it, it is, it's the standard academic book on Jews in World War II. Um, there was anti-Semitism in the military experienced by Jews. Um, 
Jews, about half of the Jews were disproportionately represented in the fighting forces in World War II, which is not going to happen in Vietnam, for example. Um, the U.S. military. What's that? Um, more Jews fought in World War II than Vietnam. In Vietnam, Jews basically got the college def deferral you know, option. Um, the United States military was still segregated in World War II. It would not integrate into the Korean War. Um, so they're not going to be interacting as much across racial lines. Um, and even if it's less formalized, which would be other people of color who aren't black, um, the, the assignments are going to be in the, in the more um, subservient roles um, as opposed to you know, the higher ups. And the big difference between World War II uh, and even Korea getting to Vietnam is by the time we get to Vietnam, um, it's predominantly soldiers of color um, who are going to be put into the military combat roles. Um, and the white folk are going to be home in college. And World War II was not the case. So I think we, we, we saw more of that then. Oh, sorry, disproportionate to the population of Jews in the country. So if Jews represent 2% of the U.S. population, are they going to represent more than 2% of the soldiers in the war? So one would expect that every group would essentially have the, the same number, you know, as you're going. In World War II, more Jews were soldiers than, than were part of the American population, and in Vietnam it was less. Um, uh, first of all, new, new, anyone have new voices? And um, I'm officially one minute over, but I was not kidding when I said midnight, so I'll leave that up to you on how you want to. I was kidding. It's okay. Uh, yeah, question. Yeah. Okay, so in the '60s, you had a, you had a family member that that took a different name that was presented as more white. In the '50s, okay. Yeah, so I get a lot of feedback that white Jews aren't white. I get a lot from white Jews. White, what? Yeah. Yeah. It's very mixed. The question is, do, when, when white Jews have to check a box, like how, what are they checking? What's their awareness? It's all over the place. A lot of it is, what does it depend on? I think a lot's generational, um, but a lot's not generational. And in other words, you know, younger people tend to recognize racial privilege more than older people. So my undergraduates, by and large, my white Jewish undergraduates, Definitely, or say I'm white. Of course, I'm white. Look at me. What do you think? You know, they 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 get that they have privilege. Their grandparents, who had a different life experience as Jews and have suffered anti-Semitism more, are like, "Are you kidding?" Um, and by the way, if you think you're white now, just wait till next week. You're going to lose your whiteness, right? Because it's a conditional thing. And that's the thing about socially constructed racial definitions that white Jews have been in Nazi Germany, definitely not white, and sitting here today, definitely, definitely white. Yeah, and and people are really. I, I want to appreciate how everyone's situated here because I get a lot of energy on this on this question for for folks that do not want to um, consider themselves white, even if they are. Yeah. Right. I, I, you know, and, and no, yeah. So the question is like, why did Jewish men um, and, and I'm sure some Jewish women too enlist? Um, and um, I'm not remembering now my reading of G.I. Jew because that's where I would go in order to get that answer. But my sense would be um, that it was part of American citizenship. All right. Actually, I do have an answer. Hitler. Hitler was the answer. You know, this, this was a way to fight Hitler. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah.
Okay. Drafted, yeah. Right, so we're hearing. Right, all right, so, so this is the draft, right. Yeah. Right. That's 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 fascinating. That's uh, um, I want to maybe maybe in closing um, give you homework if you're interested or not. Um, so much of what we just talked about on whiteness actually um, moves into themes of, of my last book, which is called Black Power Jewish Politics, because the book uh, landed just before the racial reckoning and then everyone understood Zoom and then the racial reckoning and um, Everybody was very interested in now understanding Jews and race and things like what we've been talking about now. I did in the 15 months of the reckoning, 130 Zoom classes, mostly at synagogues, but JCCs and universities. Um, the thing sold out three times. Um, now, academic books don't have large print runs, so it's not a big deal to sell out three times. But the reason academic books have small print runs is they never sell out. So yay me, you know. And on the fourth time, they asked me to write a new preface for the book. And it was gonna be a puff piece, which is basically like, wow, Jewish America is just figuring out race and Dollinger had it in a thesis of a book published a few years ago, you know, and, and what that's all. And I wrote it and I sent it in and they came back and said, um, not only is this good, but we wanna co-publish it in LA Review of Books, you know, to get more prominence. I'm like, oh, yay me. Um, and then 24 hours later, I get an email that, um, somebody has exerted power and has determined that this thing should never be published. And they have now sent it to the book for its fourth printing without the new preface, um, which is an abuse of all sorts of academic freedom stuff and everything. Um, it happened to be a um, white senior male Brandeis University historian who did that. And um, as I was trying to negotiate with them about how wrong this was, um, I reached out to my five colleagues, including Eric Goldstein, you know, um, and said, would you read this new preface and would you criticize it and give me a critique because they're telling me it's no good and I think it's fine. Um, and when the five of them read it, they went ballistic. They went ballistic because they thought it was actually three of the five thought I didn't go far enough because I used the words white supremacy. That was the objection. I said, since World War II, American Jews, white Jews, have benefit from a system of white supremacy, which I thought was pretty clear. Um, I was on social media, they said that I was saying Jews were white supremacists, which I didn't, I was not saying that. You know, white supremacy is a system that gives privilege to white people. White supremacists kill Jews when they pray. There's a big difference between the two, even if the words are subtle. Um, it ended up breaking in the foreword. Um, as the top of the fold lead story on this controversy. And that news article won the National Jewish Press's most important newspaper article of the year. Um, and then that created a lot of op-eds for people who um, liked my views of Jews and whiteness or definitely did not like my views of Jews and whiteness. So if you just type my name of white supremacy on Google when you get home, um, you'll be up till three in the morning, you know. It just, you can sort of dive in deep and then so for the question was like, what happens with like white Jews? Do they think they're white or not? Uh, you, a whole lot of white Jews do not think they're white and believe that, that I am the devil incarnate for having said that Jews are. So with that, thank you. Thank you for your um, patience and listening. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah.